28 says, Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth, burst into song and make music, shout for joy to the Lord the King. Thank you, Mark. Welcome to the service this morning. My name is Anne-Marie and we are from King's Church, Penwitham near Preston. You're very welcome to join us. And we heard from Mark from Psalm 98 about singing to the Lord a new song. If you read further down, make music to the Lord, let the sea resound, let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains sing for joy. Every creature, and every creation joining together to sing to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can join together with creation, with the angels, and shout for joy to you today. We ask that you would be close to us this morning as we um, worship together, study the word. You would encourage us and you would leave us feeling challenged and refreshed. So we thank you for being with us today. 
and for being our Father and loving us. Amen. So just a, a notice on Wednesdays, as we know, we are doing a Bible study and Kevin is going to start a new series on 1 John. So Wednesday night, join with us at 7.30 for the new series on 1 John. And this morning, I'd like to introduce you to John, our national leader of the Free Methodist. He has a word of encouragement for us. Then we'll go to Jill and listen to the story for the children and then on to Liz and sing some worship. So I'll leave you with John's thought for the day. In pastoral care, the words we use and how we use them is vitally important. Proverbs 16 verse 24 says, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Becky and I are going to read from Ty Green, who is commentating on this verse. He says, speech is an awesome responsibility. It's hard to imagine that our casual comments can have eternal implications, but they can. God anoints them for blessing and Satan uses them for cursing. Both blessings and curses have a dramatic impact on the heart and soul of human beings. They often dictate the direction we go forever. That's why pleasant words are sweet and soothing. They have deep spiritual impact. They are not neutral claims of neutral people. They are vehicles for both power of God and the corruption of this world. They can be inspired by the Holy One or hijacked by the evil one. They matter a lot. So let our speech be redemptive, and most of all, let it point to God. Hello. <clears throat> Fudge is here with us this morning, aren't you, Fudge? But you've not been feeling very happy, have you? What's, what's been the problem, Fudge? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Scruffy, the dog next door, stole your bone, didn't he? And it was your best bone. Oh dear. And then head to the cat from next door. He laughed at you, didn't he? And it made you feeling very upset. That was very unkind, wasn't it? But you got your own back. Oh dear, Fudge, why, what happened? You beat Scruffy on the tail. And then you chased Hector up a tree. Oh, fudge, that's not very kind, is it? Do you feel a bit sorry for that, fudge? A, a little bit sorry. Oh, dear. You feel sorry for Hector. Why do you feel sorry for Hector? He's still up the tree. Oh, fudge, that's awful, isn't it? Do you think uh, you should feel sorry? Because mm, it wasn't very kind, was it? Although it wasn't very kind what they did to you either. But you know, when we say sorry, we should really mean that we're sorry. And it should mean that we don't do it again. So I think, Fudge, you need to forgive them, don't you? Hmm. You know, we all do things that are wrong, don't we? And when we do wrong things, they hurt other people. And they always hurt God. <clears throat> and so we need to be always ready to say sorry. And sometimes, like fudge, we get hurt too by others. And we should always be ready to forgive them, fudge. One of Jesus' friends, Peter, once asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone? He thought, Seven times would be a good thing. That sounds a lot to you, does it, Fudge? You think twice, two or three times would be enough? Well, Jesus said, not seven times, but 70 times seven. 490 times. Well, actually, he didn't mean 490 times. He meant we should always 
keep on forgiving and be ready to forgive someone. Not just once or twice, but as many times as it takes. And when we say sorry, we're really saying to somebody, please will you forgive us? And there are lots of things we can be say sorry for. And I'm going to use my hand to help us. I have to remember you've only got paws. Well, paws are a bit like hands. And I'm actually hoping that the children will understand this fudge. Right, first of all, a fist. And a fist reminds me that sometimes we're angry and we shout. And we want to maybe even kick somebody. Like you, biting Scruffy's tail. Yes, you're right. Sometimes we point our finger and say, you did that, it was your fault. A bit like you again, yes. You thought um, Hector had started it all off by laughing at you, didn't you? Mm. Sometimes we are very, very selfish. We keep things to ourselves so we don't share our toys or our best crayons or our best pens or our lawnmowers or whatever things we like ourselves. We keep them to ourselves and that's being selfish. Sometimes we say things that are wrong. Maybe we use bad language or maybe we tell things that aren't true. Or maybe we pass on a story which isn't quite true, like gossiping. That's not good. We need to say sorry because that might hurt somebody. Sometimes we pretend we haven't seen somebody who needs help. Or maybe we've looked at something that we know that is bad in a book or on the television or on the internet. And we need to say sorry for that too. And sometimes we cover our ears and we pretend we've not heard something. That somebody calling out for us to help them. Maybe help them at home. Maybe mum saying, will you, come and, uh, will you come and tidy your bedroom please? And we're not listening to that. Then we've got to say sorry, haven't we? <clears throat> because all these things hurt other people. And then sometimes those kind of things hurt us too. And then we should be ready to forgive the person who's been angry with us or said, you did that when it wasn't true. Or who have been very selfish and kept the best things for themselves or said things that aren't very helpful <clears throat> or that are helpful or pretended not to see when you wanted a friend or to listen when you asked them for help. So all those things we should be ready to forgive when people say sorry to us. You're going to forgive Scruffy for pinching your bone. You're going to try not to be so selfish. Oh well, Scruff, er, uh, Fudge. That's very good. I'm glad you've learned something this morning. And you're going to tell Hector you're sorry too. Well, I hope he's not still stuck up at tree fudge. No, it's not really funny, is it? You sure he can come down? Well, I hope so. Well, before we say goodbye, I think we should pray to you, fudge, because saying sorry and asking somebody to forgive you is something that the God tells us about in the Bible, that it's very important to say sorry to God for things we've done or said or thought that are wrong too. So let's have a prayer now. Father God, thank you that you're always ready to forgive us when we're angry or where we blame other people, whether we're selfish, whether we look at the wrong things or say wrong things. Thank you that you're always ready to forgive us. And please help us to be ready to forgive others when they've hurt us too. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, time to say goodbye, Fudge. Okay, bye.
Thank you, Liz. Isn't it just wonderful that by grace we can enter, enter, by grace we can stand, by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus calls us into his presence. We thank you, Lord, that it's none of us, but it's all of you. And we ask that you would enable us to uh, accept this and, and make ourselves available to you. So as we look to your word now, we do ask that you would be with Kevin. You would enable him to speak the word that you've given him, that we would be able to learn more and understand more of what your Holy Spirit is and who your Holy Spirit is and how we can um, include him in our lives a lot more than we do. So we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for being our father, for Jesus the Son and for the Holy Spirit you would now move upon us and challenge us as we listen to your word. Amen. Amen. So we are now going to read from Luke chapter 11 and we start at verse 5. So the reading is from Luke chapter 11 and this is about Jesus. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you though, he will not get up and give him the bread because he's his friend. Yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? But if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen. Thank you, Anne-Marie, for uh, leading us this morning's service. Lord, as we come before your face, we pray that your word would indeed be a lamp to our path and a light to our feet. As we've been looking at these past weeks at the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and we come now to consider how we can seek the Holy Spirit. Be with us. Open our hearts and minds that we may be drawn into your holy, blessed and life-giving presence. Come, Lord Jesus, and meet us, whether here or at home, that your name will get all the praise and glory. Amen. Amen. Well, we've spent a short while over the last few uh, weeks looking at the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. And it's worth reminding ourselves that we have identified an inner work that is done in the heart of believer. 
when the person is born again, when the seed of God is put into their souls and we are changed and made a new creation. But we've seen that that inner work of salvation is not the same thing as that outward baptism in the Holy Spirit, because Jesus promised you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that power for witness is not an inward thing, uh, so much as an outward thing. It's something that orientates us and sends us empowered into the world to carry the presence and blessing of God. And the strange thing is that because the two works of the Holy Spirit, the inward work and the empowering work, are so essentially different, it is possible to be saved by the Holy Spirit and yet not filled with the Holy Spirit. I think that's perhaps been the state of much of the church throughout history that they have loved Christ, but not known the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And those times in church history where God has blessed, where he has come in full flood, where the Holy Spirit has filled people's lives, they have been times of revival. And a revival comes through an outpouring of the Holy Spirit into the hearts and lives of believers. They have been touched by, inspired by and filled by the Spirit of God. And they are motivated by a vision of heaven. Now, let's be clear, that doesn't mean that the people before, before they knew the touch of the Holy Spirit were not Christians. Of course, they were they trusted in Christ. They found him living in their hearts and lives. They grew in holiness and progressed uh, in their life with God or not, <laughs> as the case may be. They heard the preaching of his word and shared it with others. They shared in the breaking of bread. They served their communities. They had a measure of blessing and God owned that mission was done but what we're talking about here is not that as it were normal working of God we're talking of God coming to revive and change his church to live in the church as he did in the days of John and Charles Wesley the church seemed to be asleep. There were many orthodox preachers. They believed in the word of God. They shared in the word of God, but there was no power. And then God took hold of these men and the power of God was known throughout the nation. It is only an outpouring of the spirit of God that is going to change the nation. I read recently about a man called David Morgan. And David Morgan uh, is reputed to have been a very ordinary preacher. You can see a picture of him uh, up there on the screen. Uh, there was nothing out of the, uh, the ordinary, nothing unusual about him. Indeed, he'd been a carpenter before he came a pre became a preacher. He wasn't tremendously well educated and he'd struggled to get into the ministry. And yet David Morgan was the man that was used in 1859 to bring revival to the country of Wales. And this is what uh, Mr. Morgan said. It says he was in a meeting one, one night and was very moved. But he said to a friend later, I went to bed that night as usual, David Morgan. I'd felt power in the service, but I went to bed that night, David Morgan. But he said, you know, when I woke up the next morning, I realised I was a different man. I felt like a lion. I felt great power. He began to preach with tremendous power and it went on for two years. And then he said to the same friend, 
One night I went to bed filled with the power that had accompanied me for two years. I woke up the next morning and found that I was David Morgan once more. And he continued to be David Morgan until he died some 15 years or so later. What can account for that? It is simply the coming of the Holy Spirit upon a man and choosing him and using him to his glory in the purpose of revival. And unless the Holy Spirit comes, we will not see revival. So what I want to talk to us today about is simply seeking the Holy Spirit. And we are clearly told that we are allowed to seek the Holy Spirit. It's there in the reading from Luke's Gospel. And so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And then, having said a little more, he goes on to say, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. We are clearly told by Jesus that we are to seek the presence of the Holy Spirit. And of course, that's not the only time this is mentioned in the scripture. Speaking of spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the Bible says, pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. And if you remember the promise that Peter gave on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, of the Holy Spirit. He says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. The assumption that is made in the New Testament is that every believer will seek and find an intimate, precious, empowering relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. We are clearly told in the Bible to seek the presence of the Holy Spirit. So the important question is this, do I have these gifts? Am I filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit? Is, as Paul put it, the love of God shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost, which he has given unto us? Has God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit that cries, Abba, Father? Am I, as Peter put it, rejoicing with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Do I have what Jesus called streams of living water flowing from within? I need to be able to answer these questions. And the answer is tremendously important. If we want to seek a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. If we want the Holy Spirit to come upon us in power, the first question uh, is to be answered with exact honesty. Where do I stand now? Do I have the Holy Spirit in my life? Did I once have the Holy Spirit? Is he empowering me now as he has done in the past? That's the first step. If we're not honest about our relationship, we will never go any further. But that's only the first step. It's the beginning. You see, some people could conclude, well, no, I don't have the Holy Spirit in the way that you're talking about. And quite frankly, I don't need or want the Holy Spirit in that way. There are many different reasons that people could have for saying that. There may be a lack of desire in their life for spiritual things. Possibly there is fear, fear of what God might do if he came upon them to take over, fear of what people might say. Not only is the fear, but poor teaching, 
that it isn't for them or it isn't for today or it's only for the elite can be things that hold us back but we read it earlier didn't we the promise is for you it's for your children it's for all who are far off it's for all whom the lord our god will call if we are too easily put off we will never know the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit of God. So the first step is honesty, but the second one is desire. We read it early, earlier, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1, it said eagerly, and it can also add the word earnestly, eagerly or earnestly, desire spiritual gifts. That speaks of an urgency in our hearts something that will not be satisfied until we know more of God and we see that we've made clear steps forward so the first one is honesty the second is desire and then the third prayer we need to persist in prayer did you notice the process that Jesus is describing here in prayer he says so I say to you ask and it will be given to you seek and you shall find knock and the door will be opened to you it's interesting that this comes after the description of the man knocking on the door of his friend the two are linked that's why Jesus gave the illustration first and then said so I say to you in other words because of what's gone before because of that description of a man having a friend come to his door late at night and having nothing to lay before him in the way of food having to go to his neighbor and knock even after his neighbor is in bed and getting turned down after that Jesus says so I say to you, he's called the importunate neighbour. That's an old word, isn't it? It just means persistent. And you notice that the first answer was no. In fact, the man was quite hostile towards him. He said, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Now, God is not like an irritable neighbour. But the context is that the first time he asked, he got a refusal. That seems a strange thing. If God wants to give us the Holy Spirit, why would there be a refusal? I think it's because we have to be certain that we want God's gifts. It's no use approaching God with a vague interest or just coming casually and saying, yeah, well, I would like some more of your Holy Spirit. We need to persist until God grants our request. And many people have gone to God and they've asked that God would fill them or baptize them in the Holy Spirit. But nothing has happened straight away. And because of that, they've been discouraged and they have stopped seeking. Their desire did not overcome the initial problems. And we have to be willing to push past the obstacles when we come to ask. I remember uh, the story of a young man, uh, and, and I knew him, um, who explained that he had been to a meeting and gone out to the front uh, to ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit and he'd been prayed for uh, and he'd gone home not sure that anything had happened and so he'd gone to his friend that was an older Christian uh, and his friend says well perhaps you should try and speak in other tongues uh, and see if God has given you that gift and so the young man went to his bedroom and, and began to pray uh, and he prayed for a whole week before anything happened. Nothing seemed to happen. Very faltering. And it was only, he told me, at the end of the week 
when he got earnest and cried out to God from his heart, Lord, I want this gift. Nothing else will do. Please give me the gift. When he got serious with God, the gift was given. Let's look at these stages in prayer that Jesus tells us about. He describes them so they, they must be important. And I notice with the words ask, seek, knock, there is a growing urgency, but there is also a nearing proximity. There's ask is at some distance, seek, we are looking for diligently and knock, by the time you're knocking, you're right at the door, you're about to enter in, you're gaining admittance. John Barnes is a commentator and he says of these words, the phrases signify to seek with earnestness and diligence and perseverance. <laughs> so there's no passing interest here. It is earnest, it is diligent. We have to wrestle as Jacob wrestled with the angelic being and as day broke and the angel was saying it was time for him to leave he said in Genesis 32 let me go for the day breaks but Jacob replied I will not let you go unless you bless me and that is the spirit we need that says I am coming to ask fervently diligently, persistently, until I find the blessing of God. The word ask, of course, is the word petition. It means to bring our need honestly and urgently before God. But, but it carries the idea with it of a lesser coming to a greater, like Queen Esther went to King Xerxes. She came in fear and trembling to some degree. She knelt before him. He extended the scepter and she was received and given her, her heart's desire. And we have to come to God knowing that he is the great king, that he has the right to give these gifts. But it speaks of coming not to demand, but coming in humility and asking God to meet our needs. I think part of it is just to talk it over with God, saying, God, this is where I stand. This is what's going on in my heart. Would you come and meet these needs? I like the prayer of D.L. Moody, the great American preacher from the last century. Before he was filled with the Holy Spirit, this was his prayer. Oh, Lord, prepare my heart and baptize me with the Holy Ghost's power. That's good, isn't it? He prayed for his heart to be ready. Oh, Lord, prepare my heart and baptize me with the Holy Ghost's power. And so he came with humility. And of course, God spoke uh, and uh, commanded, as it were, that he would use Mr. Moody. We need to come to God knowing that he will give what he has promised. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 7 and verse 37? Well, you will. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, and then out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. God has promised his Holy Spirit to the thirsty. And it isn't talking about a thirst like, oh, I could do with a cup of tea. Anne-Marie, could you make me a cup of tea? We're not talking about that. We're talking about a thirst that needs to be satisfied, that, that knows that there is something missing in our lives and says, Lord, if you don't come to meet that, then there is no hope. That is what asking tells us in this circumstance. The word seeking is slightly different, of course. Uh, it's used in uh, Matthew 13 of the man that was seeking pearls and he found one pearl of great price and he sold everything he had to get that pearl. It was the man's passion. It was the man's 
heart's desire. That was the goal of his life. He was a man seeking pearls. And that's the picture that Jesus gives when he says that we are to seek the Holy Spirit. It's to be our passion, our desire, the goal of our life to know him more fully. This word seek can also have the connotation of thinking things through. It, it means to ponder, to consider, to make inquiry into. And there may be things that are holding us back in our life that we don't understand about the ministry or work of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is encouraging us to look diligently into these things to go deeper with God to experience him more do you have questions that need clearing up is there somebody you know that has an experience of God that you can go and talk to have you read the lives of men and women who have known a touch of God in their lives I perhaps meant to, uh, mentioned to you earlier what a friend of mine uh, used to say. If you find somebody that's got something good from God, rub up next to them because some of it may well rub off on you. Uh, and it is true that bad company corrupts good character. But when we keep the right company, it can lift us up and ennoble and inspire us. But we can read about people who found God's blessing. We can read about the uh, great revivals of the past, the uh, people of prayer in the past, and allow their lives to inspire us to find God more. And though we might be in a hurry, I don't get the sense with these words that there is any hurry here. Ask, are we given seek and you will find knock and the door will be opened to you but it's not something that is frantic it's something we have to be patient about it's something we need to persist in to set our mind on until we find that God has answered our prayer and moved in our lives I don't know about you but I have found in the past that when I've been asking God to move, sometimes it's taken weeks, months or years, and then suddenly it's done. And you can't imagine why it didn't happen before, but God steps in and the very need you've been praying for is met. And sometimes we need to have patience as we ask him, as we seek to understand and go deeper. Matthew Henry, the great commentator, said, if God does not answer our prayers speedily, he will in due time, if we continue to pray. Again, there's this mark of consistency. God is not like a vending machine where you put your pound in and out drops the bottle of drink. It isn't like that. We have to seek and go deeper. It was the experience of the apostles they sought in the upper room between the Ascension and the day of Pente Pentecost. It was the experience of Cornelius. He sent for the apostle Peter to come to him and he was in prayer and seeking God when the apostle came. And so we're encouraged to seek prayerfully. My own experience was very much um, that I had to seek God over a period of time when I was stale in my ministry. Um, I think it would have been during some of our time in Jersey. I was in my 40s. Uh, I'd uh, done my first degree at Manchester University. Uh, I was going to Cliff College and studying for a master's degree. Uh, and that's not to make me sound anybody special. In fact, it had an adverse effect on me to some uh, extent. Uh, the tutors were very clear that in the master's degree, we'd chosen to study God academically. And so it wasn't about knowing God, it was about learning about God. And the more I learned about God, the drier I felt inside. And I just needed a touch from God. 
most places I went, it, it seemed that everything that was being talked about, I already knew. Nothing seemed to be exciting or new. And yet I knew that God was offering more. Well, fortunately, uh, I had offered for a what was called a ministry exchange at the time. And a lady from Detroit came to Jersey and I went from Jersey to Detroit, not the safest city to minister in throughout the summer for six weeks. But during those six weeks, we were given a short time off and we drove what must have been five or six hours across Detroit and then across Canada to the city of Toronto, where at that time they had been experiencing revival for about 10 years. And I went in dry and tired and really with nothing much to say. And as I walked into the meeting, the presence of God was there. And in the presence of God, somebody who was burnt out and tired and bored with my Christian faith found a new touch of God, so much so that I could virtually see the cloud of glory in that place. Now, I know that some people have spoken against things that have happened in Toronto. Uh, and of course, this is many years ago now. But I know this, in that place when I was in my need, I met with God. God poured out his presence into my life in a wonderful way and it carried me to the next level of my Christian walk and remained with me for at least the next five years and beyond. It was wonderful, but it came because one, there was a need and two, there was a willingness to seek God to meet that need. Ask seek, knock. What's knock? Well, it literally just means bang on the door, doesn't it? It's as simple as that. You're by the door, you want admittance, it's time to come in. Remember, it is the blood of Christ that grants us admittance into the holy place of God. The picture we're given is the same picture that was given of the a high priest, whenever he went into the presence of God, he had to go carrying blood. And only the high priest was allowed in. Now, the temple curtain has been torn in two from top to bottom. The doorway into God's presence is open and we come through the blood of Christ. And when we come into his presence, we enter into the manifest, the revealed glory of God. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, We who with unveiled faces, beholding the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And coming into his presence really does feel like entering into the holy place, entering into the place where the glory is known. And each of us needs that. God will draw us in in different ways. But if we are willing to seek his face, he is willing to give his presence. Ask, seek, knock. And for sure, when his presence comes, you'll know. <laughs> you'll know because it will be one of those moments when you meet with God face to face. Now, one of the questions that people sometimes ask me is, how will I know? How do I know that this is from God if I am getting uh, what I asked? Well, surely Jesus dealt with this himself, didn't he? Um, he said that uh, if uh, somebody came and asked uh, for, uh, I'm just looking for it here, here in the reading. 
asked, which of your fathers, he said in verse 11, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If we come to God the Father and we ask for the Holy Spirit, the promise is he will not give us something that hurts us. He will give the Holy Spirit, the one he promised. How much more? Well, I don't know. <laughs> more than we can take, more than we need. Enough to meet the need for today. If we have a uh, desire for God, then we need not be concerned when we come to ask for the Holy Spirit. He is a good father. He has promised to give what we ask. You will find, however, the other side of the experience, some confirmations. The first is this. When we meet the Holy Spirit, we will have a deeper desire for holiness. It will be something that we want to be part of our being. There will be a greater understanding of and desire to know the word of God. Things will fall into place that you haven't seen before and his word will become most precious. There will be an explosion from your heart and my heart of worship and songs will pour out with ease. We won't be arguing about this song or that song will just be joyfully singing and there will be an ease of witness. It won't be hard to share our faith. Uh, I remember when God touched me uh, after I had, uh, had had an operation. Uh, I went to see the doctor uh, some days later and I just couldn't help but tell the doctor not about the pain of the operation, but how I'd met God in the midst of that pain. And all the doctor could say is, well, that's wonderful. Uh, but it just came out naturally. And those are confirmations afterwards that what God has done is real. A desire for holiness, an understanding of the scripture, an explosion of worship, an ease of witness. There are of course a couple of hindrances that can get in the way. The first is sin. When the apostle Peter stood before the Sanhedrin on trial in Acts chapter 5, and was told not to preach anymore in Jesus' name. This is what he said. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The inference was, of course, that the Sanhedrin didn't have the Holy Spirit because they were not obeying God. And that's important. If we cherish our pet sins, if we are unwilling to repent and see our heart cleansed, we are very unlikely uh, to have a filling of the Holy Spirit. God is sometimes very gracious and helps us along the way. I remember John Shelbourne, who was a pastor some years ago at New Life in Lincoln. And uh, John said at one point he got a call from a very high up official in the cathedral. Uh, and he was called into his office to speak to this man. Uh, and all the time that John was there, he was chain smoking, uh, just one cigarette after another. Uh, and he said, John, I've heard that you uh, can tell me how I can get filled with the Holy Spirit. John's reply may not have been uh, PC, uh, but it was important. He says, well, the first thing you need to do is give up the smoking. What did he mean by that? What he meant was if we've got something that's addicting our life that's in the way, it has to be dealt with. That doesn't mean that we've earned the presence of the Holy Spirit. What it means is that the way we live can exclude us from finding the touch of God that we want. And if we cherish our pet sins, then we are not going to find the touch of God that we need. The other uh, warning is, of course, about being double minded. James speaks about that. Oh, I'm not sure I want this. Yes, no. Yes, no. He says the double minded man is unstable in all his ways. 
Such a man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. But there are some helps. If we are seeking God to touch us in a deeper way, <laughs> sometimes the laying on of hands helps. If we had been able to meet in person at the close of service, we could have uh, had laying on of hands and just prayed for one another. Uh, you know, but it's possible to pray for one another at home. Just take each other's hands and pray that God's spirit would come upon the ones you love. It's not just for the apostles to pray. If you remember, the apostle Paul was filled with the spirit when Ananias, an ordinary member of the church, laid his hands upon him. So sometimes the laying on of hands can be a help. So let's just review. If we are seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, and that's what I pray that all of us want, then... Firstly, we need to understand that the gift is for us. We are not excluded. We are invited. Jesus invites us to seek his presence. And then we must be honest about where we stand and bring our desire before God. Talk it through with the Lord. And once we've done that, we need to set out on that journey of asking, of seeking, of knocking. For some it will come quickly for others not so quickly but wherever we are we need to persist until we take the next step that God has for us Hosea put it this way break up your unplowed ground before it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness upon you so let us pray Lord, give us a heart that is willing to turn from the things of this world and seek your presence. If the Lord says, seek his face, may our response be, your face I will seek. So we pray, come, Holy Spirit, fill us anew with your power fall upon us and guide us. Take us close to you as we ask and seek and knock for your presence. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, it's been a delight to spend these few weeks looking at the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We're probably going to move on and look at something else uh, in the near future, but, but I trust that that will have been a impetus, a spark, a seed that will get you seeking uh, to know more of God. Um, because God is wondrous. Uh, and our closing song uh, from Mark is going to tell us of the wonders of God's love for us. It says, who is there like you? And so we close with worship as we sing together. Stand and join us, uh, if you would, at home. Who is there like you? Thank you, Mark. In Psalm 25, verse 1, it says, In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I'm trusting in your word, trusting in your cross, trusting in your blood and all your faithfulness for your power at work in me is changing me.
my voice, lifting up your name, and in your grace I rest, for your love has come to me, and set me free, I'm trusting in your word, trusting in your cross, trusting in your blood, and all your faithfulness. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today at King's Church. I have to say it's been a great privilege over these last few weeks, both in person and online, to share something about the baptism in the Holy Spirit in this season of Pentecost. It's a practical issue. It's not just something for the mind, but it's for the heart. And, and so... I would suggest put some time aside in your diary, either today or in the days ahead, if things are already booked up today, where you can spend time in God's presence and begin to give your heart back to him and say, Lord, fill me in you. We can sing it as we've done so many times. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me melt me, mould me, fill me. But if we don't get practical, then really nothing will happen. These things are not just for the head, they are for the heart. And, and God desires to pour his spirit out on all who seek him. So Spend that time with the Lord. Begin to ask and seek and knock and just see where he takes you. Don't fear. Simply open your heart to the living God that he may fill and inspire you and take you to the place that he wants you 
to be. He has a new revelation, I am sure, for each one of us. Now, perhaps it would be wise to uh, close uh, with some notices. Uh, firstly, to say uh, thank you uh, to Liz and to Mark, who've been leading us in worship today. Uh, thank you earlier for the story as well. Um, people will be wondering what we're going to be doing about Sundays. When are we coming back? Well, we met this last week as a lockdown task force amongst the leadership. Uh, and we looked at the rise of cases uh, and it's certain that in our area cases are still on the up and up. And though the vaccine uh, is getting round, uh, we are going to be cautious just for a little while longer. So our plan at the moment is that we will be back in worship uh, at the Priory Academy in Penwitham on the 18th of July. So put that date in your diary. If it changes for any reason, earlier or later, we will let you know. But for now, uh, we're just taking that cautious approach. We're trusting God, but we're not wanting any of our people to get ill. Uh, and so we're going to be back, we trust, on the 18th of July, 10.30 in the morning. And we will send out uh, emails to confirm that. And uh, it'll probably be the last Sunday that we have to um, register to come. We'll wait and see what Boris says, of course, on the 19th. Then in addition to that, because we are still in this sort of semi-lockdown uh, part we're going to continue with a midweek exposition a bible study we were looking at jonah recently uh, before that we looked at easter and we looked at the psalms uh, well patrick gave us a little uh, clue as to the way forward last week he opened up first john to us but of course there is an awful lot in the letter of one john uh, so that's where we're going to go on Wednesday evenings at 7.30. We'll begin an exposition chapter by chapter uh, of uh, the first letter of John. It's a letter that has many famous verses in it, and it's a tremendously practical letter. Let me just give you a few of the verses. Uh, 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness or first john chapter 3 and verse 1 how great is the love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of god and that is what we are or 1 john 4 and verse 1 dear friends do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from god for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Or 1 John 4 and verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Uh, or 1 John 5 and verse 11, this is the testimony God has given us eternal life and that life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He do, who does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The book of 1 John is tremendously encouraging uh, and it's one that uh, it can really take our understanding and our uh, sense of confidence in God to the next level. So join us on a Wednesday evening. We're going to start with 1 John and the introduction uh, this Wednesday night at 7.30. Again, we're so glad you're able to join with us today. Let's close with a prayer of blessing. May the Lord himself bless you. May he keep you in time of trial. May he guide you on straight paths. May he fill you with his Holy Spirit. May you know that love of God and love him in return and reflect that love to others. And the peace of God that surpasses understanding will keep your heart and mind in unison 
with Christ Jesus. May God himself bless, guide and keep you this day and then forevermore. Amen. I'm Pastor Kevin Jones. It has been a pleasure to share with you this morning. May the Lord bless you. Amen.